Welcome to Live Doth, your online Doth Yomi Shear. Shalom, welcome back to today's Daf, which is Erevin Daf Lamed Hey. We are 10 lines from the top of the Amid and discussing a case where a person placed the food for his Erev into a, a large size closet, a migdal. So it's locked inside this closet with no key in sight. We have a Machlegis now, Mishnah. Ramea says, this Erev is valid because theoretically he has the ability to access the food which is in this migdal. Whereas Rebleza says, unless he has a key, Within reach, this Erev is invalid because he has no access to the food within this locked closet. Says the more ten lines from the top, Rabbah of Rav Yosef, the Amritavayu, they both explained what is the basis of the Machleg Sanao Mishnah. So they explained as follows. We're speaking about a wooden closet. And what is the Machleg? The Mar Savar Kliu. Rameyer holds this large size Migdal is classified as a utensil. And if it's a kli, then there's no halacha of binyan or soiser when it comes to a kli. Ve'en binyan bekelim, ve'en steer bekelim. There's no malacha in a Torah of building or demolishing when it involves a kli. Therefore, in a Torah, he has full access to the food within this locked wooden closet. He simply breaks it open and accesses his food. Umar savar oyuhu. However, Blazer maintains this large size closet is considered to be an oil, like a structure. And therefore, he has no ability to access the food locked therein because he can't demolish it. That involves a malachim and a tear of soysa. So the question is whether this large size middle shalait is classified as a kli, in which case he has access to the food inside, or it's classified as an oil, in which case he has no access to the food therein because it involves a malachim and a tear of soysa. And if he has no access to the food, then that food there cannot activate his error. Says the more repluk the Dhani Tanoi. This Machlekis is actually compatible with another Machlekis Tanoi who seem to be arguing about this very point. Whether this large size closet is classified as a clear or oil. This none, or some have the Sanya, we learned in the Brysa. This is uh, involving a Zav. We know that a Zav who moves something, he transfers Tuma to that thing, even if he doesn't actually come into contact with it, if he's wearing a glove. That's called Heset HaZav. It's an indirect interaction with the Zav. So if he moves something, it becomes tummy. What if the Zav banged on top of a Shida, which is a large size carriage, Teva, a chest, a middle large size closet, Hikesh al Gabi, Shida Teva Migdo, Tmein. So if you move them in this manner, they become tummy. This is the Shita of the Tanakam. Rab Nechemya, Rab Shimon Matar, they maintain that this large sized chest remains tar. My love, shall we not say, This very question is actually the point of contention here. Ma Savar Kliu, Tanakam holds that this large size structure, this large size closet, armor, carriage, is classified as a clean. Therefore, if it's moved by the Zav, it becomes Tomei. Umar Savar Oyu. As opposed to Rab and Rab Shimon, they hold this large size thing is called an oil. It's like a tent, like a, like a structure, like a home, which cannot be Makabal Tuma. The Zav uh, touches a home, it doesn't become Tomei. Therefore, although the Zav here moved the, the Shida Teva Migdal, they're considered to be an oil. And they will not become Tommy as a result. So what proposes that just as we find the Machlekes in this price, whether this large size Migdal is classified as a Kli or oil pertaining to Tumas Zav, likewise, this will be the very point of Machlekes in our mission. Whether this Migdal is called a Kli, which allows one to break it to access the food therein, or it's called an oil, which prevents a person from demolishing it to access his food, and therefore the Arab is inaccessible. Omra, Abaye, you can't say this. If it is, bro, can you really think, can you really suggest that this question is the very point of a contention in this Machlekes here regarding the Zav? That's actually not so. Fatanya, because haven't we learned in a different place? Oyel v'nisat tamit. 
when something is an oil, a true oil, a tent, but it's transportable, meaning it was moved by the Zav, oil vin nisat, it was moved by the Zav, tamay, even though it's an oil. If it was moved, it becomes tamay, machmas, the heset of the Zav. Kli, vein nisat, Conversely, if you have a, a kli, something which all agree is classified as a kli, it's a small size kli, but it was not actually moved by the Zav. For instance, it was nailed into the ground, or it's too heavy, that the, that the Zav cannot, cannot move it. Tar, all agree, there's no Thomas Hesed applicable to this type of Kli. So the Bible clearly tells us that it's unrelated to the classification of the item here. Even if something's considered an oil, but if it's been moved by the Zav, if it can be moved, and it was moved, it's Tommy. In contrast to a Kli, we are, it's something which can't be moved, it's nailed into the ground, it's heavy. So this, this type of kli cannot have heset hazav. So it's very clear that it has nothing to do with how we classify it. If it was moved by the zav, it's tame. Otherwise it's tar, uktani sefer. And likewise, we actually learned in this sefer, the latter part of that, previous b'raisa, discussing the machlaik zetuyin on tamekam and rechemya, the Bryce concludes by saying, "Vimahoyu nisoitin tmein." Getting back to the Shida Teva Migdal, the Bryce says, "If they were actually moved by the Zav, all agree that it's tamei." The Bryce concludes, "Zachal, this is your general rule of thumb." Nisad machmas koychet tamei. If the item was actually moved as a result of the direct koyach of the Zav, he directly moved it. Surely it's tamei. Whether it's an oil, whether it's a kli, machmas ra'ada toher. If the item moved, not directly to the Zav, rather as a result of Ra'ada, a, a tremor, a quake. For instance, the Zav stamped his foot on the ground next to the, next to this chest. And as a result of that bang, the chest quivered and, and shaked and shook. This thing is tar, because it's a very indirect form of, of, uh, of, of interaction with the Zav. Rashi calls it koyach koychay. It's doubly removed from the zav. He banged the floor. The, blo- the floor received that, that, that energy and created that tremor which in turn shook this migdal. That's too indirect to be considered too masheset. So the Bryce sets forth a claw. If there's a direct movement, it's tummy. If it's very indirect movement, then it's tar. But in any case, we see that even this, this uh, migdal would be tame if it was moved directly by the Zav. So apparently, there's no machlaikas there in that, in that b'raisa between Tanakama and Rechemya, whether this uh, migdal is classified like a kli and it can have tuma by being moved by the Zav, or classified as an oil and cannot receive tuma through being moved by the Zav. The b'raisa clearly tells us it's unrelated to the classification of the item. The pointer is one question. Was it moved directly by the Zav? In which case it's Tomei. Indirectly, in which case it's Tar. So you can't say that the point of Machlekes is whether this Migdal is regarded as a clear oil. It doesn't seem to have any relation to the Machlekes discussed there. Says the Gemara Elam Abaye, indeed, it's unrelated to that question. The question there is a different question whether this migdal was actually moved by the Zav. Meaning, whether it's a kli, whether it's an oil, if it's moved directly by the Zav, it becomes tummy. So what is the question there? The kuli am all agree. Hesed machmas koichay tummy. If the kli or the oil was moved directly through the koyach of the Zav, certainly it becomes tummy. That's agreed upon by all. Machmas ra'ada tar. If a milli was moved as a result of a tremor in the ground, the Zav banged the floor, and that in turn shook and moved this item, all agree that's too far removed from the Zav, and it remains tar. So in both these scenarios all agree regarding the halacha of this item. If it's a direct contact, a direct movement, it's tummy. If it's indirect movement, it's tar. So what then is the point of Machlekes here? Says Abaye, you know what we're speaking about here? 
machmas koiche askinam. It shook as a result of a direct koiach of the zav. So the zav banged the, the uh, shida. He banged right on it. But it merely shook as a result of that bang. It was a ra'ada. It was a, a quake, a tremor. It didn't actually move out of its spot. So it was a direct, a direct uh, tremor, which was, which was applied to it by the zav. So the question here is, is this considered to be hesed azav? If it shook, but it didn't move out of its place. And this will be the machlekes. The marasavar have a hesed. Tamakama holds, this as well is considered to be movement. And therefore it becomes tamit through the zav. Umarasavar love a hesed. However, the other tanayir, mechemya, rab shimon, they hold, merely quaking and shivering and shaking is not considered to be hesed. It's not a drastic enough effect from the act of the Zav and is not included in the category of Tumas Hesed and therefore it remains Tar. Let's stop for a moment. So regarding Tumas Hesed, the Gemara tells us that Tumas Hesed can apply to a clay or to an oil equally. There's no, there's no distinction between the two. The question is whether it moved or not. The Gemara gives us three categories. If it was Hesed Machmas Koychai, meaning it actually moved out of its place as a result of direct Action of the Zav, then it's Tamit. If it was only Hesed Machmas Re'oda, if it moved as a result of a tremor, which was affected by the Zav, he banged the floor near this item, which, which in turn caused this item to move out of its place, all agree that's too far removed from the act of the Zav, and it remains Tar. When there was a Re'oda Machmas Kaychay, meaning the Zav directly impacted this Chayfetz, but it didn't remove out of its place. It, it was, was not removed out of its location. It simply shook and quivered. Now we have a machlekes. Is that considered to be hesed or not? So it has nothing to do with whether something is an oil or a kli because all these halachas will apply equally to something which is a kli or something which is an oil. So getting back to our Mishnah here, we were exploring the, the pshat and the when he has his food locked into this migdal, Rameya says it's accessible, Rabbi says it's not accessible. So initially the Mori wanted to say, the Machlech says, whether we classify this migdal as an oil, which uh, prevents him from breaking it open, or we classify it as a kli, which allows him to get in there. And we said it's compatible with the Machlechus regarding Zav, but the Gemara discounted that approach, because apparently the discussion by Ziva is not related to this question how to classify something, whether a kli or oil. So let's get back to our Mishnah. If so, If that's the case, how are we going to establish and interpret our Mishnah? Meaning, as Rashi explains, if we're speaking about a small size migdal, which cannot contain the amount of 40 sa, all agree it's a kli. And certainly, he should be able to break it open to get his food. If we're speaking about a large size middle, which can't contain 40 so, all would agree it's classified as an oil. In which case, you'd be prevented from breaking it open. So when does this machlekes apply? Says the Gemara, Abayi Barava, the Amr Tavai, they both explain as follows. Very simple machlekes. Bemino, bemano, the karta, bemisnaskina. We're speaking about even a large size middle, which is perhaps an oil. And it was closed up, it was locked up with a, a rope. That's how we locked up the, uh, the amygdala. Uboi sakina lemifsake, which requires a knife to cut it open. So in order to access this food, he needs to actually cut that rope open. So the question is as follows. Can he bring a knife for this purpose? Tanakama sava lo krav yoisi. Tanakama rab meyer. Who says his food is accessible because he was like a Yis? The Amar, Kola Kale Matom Bashabas, all types of kale can be moved on Shabbos. Chutz, Mimasra Godel, a large, except for a large size saw, the Yasashemach Resha, or this rod which was used as part of the plow. These things are delicate and designated for their specific malacha. It's called Muktzamach Maschasar and Kis. A person wouldn't, wouldn't divert its use for other purposes due to its and it's high value, and it's uh, the fact that it's delicate. But otherwise, uh, a typical standard knife can be used to cut through a rope. And therefore he holds the food of the air is accessible. 
He also to Nehemia, who subscribes a unique sheet when it comes to Moksa. The Amar, I feel a talus, even a a baguette. I feel a tarvad, even a spoon. They can only be moved on Shabbos if he's moving it for the sake of its designated use. So he wants to wear the talus? Sure, go ahead and carry it. If he wants to use a spoon to scoop something out, some food, sure. But to take a knife, which is designated primarily to be used for cutting meat, cutting bread, and use it to cut a rope, it's off limits for that purpose. He cannot be metaphored for that. Therefore, a blazer holds. He has no way to get his food, which requires a knife to cut the rope open to access the food. And therefore, he says, the Arab is invalid because it's out of reach. Let's take a look at Rashi inside here. So Rashi here is towards the middle of the column, exactly 27 lines from the top of the Amr. Rashi begins with Umas Nisan. So we're coming to interpret our mission. Umas Nisan, the era of my Kminila, how are we going to establish it? How are we going to explain it? The Lukuliam all agree. If Gadalhu, if this Migdal is large in size, oil. If I'm my Ruvi Erev, why is it called an Erev? Because if it's an oil, he has no access to it. He can't break it. It involves a Mullah of Saisa. E cotton. If it's a small size Migdal, Shayn a Mahzak Mem Sabalach. Doesn't contain 40 so. Kliu, all agree, it's regarded as a Kli. And he can break it open to get his food. Oh, my time at Rablezer. And what will be the reason of Rablezer, who considers the food locked inside this Migdal as out of reach? Says the Merkata Remisna was speaking about this Migdal, which was. Tied up with a rope. Kosher hamanul bechevel. Uboi sakinul mipsake. And a knife is required to cut it open. Says Rashi, do you have a matzil mipsake be yodai? Because if he can merely use his hands, he can manually open up this lock. Shabra dummy, I feel a blazer. We'll be fine even contra blazer. Dei chaticha asur el bemachuba. Because the isr of chaticha, malacha, would only apply cutting. Cutting away from something. Mechuber, perhaps actually means something which is connected to the ground. So he's pulling something off. He's cutting something off from something else. Whether connected to the ground or whether he's chopping something off from something else. Here, he's not cutting a piece. He's not slicing something from a larger piece. He's merely destroying something. He's breaking apart this, this lock. He's cutting open the rope. He's destroying it. Vishoring, that's mutter. The kalim which are sealed, matir, you can untie, mafkia, and rav, bechoitachan, katam. Ve'av, gav, dachol, oil, hu, ask Rashi Akash. Perhaps we're speaking about a migdal which is large in size, which is an oil. Fabian and Hassam, and the Gemara tells us there, shebekarka asalachtich. He cannot cut open the seal of something which is in the ground. So how can he go ahead and cut open the the lock, the rope of the oil, which is considered to be like a structure. Says Rashi, it's only Xer de Rabbonanhi. The Mexic is so That limitation only is only the Rabbonan. Because it appears like he's demolishing. Well, he says, because he's not really doing so sir. He's merely opening an, a doorway, an entranceway. He's breaking this thing to get open, to get the thing open. So it's only the Rabbonan. So although we're speaking about oil, there's no Malachah de Rais here. And as we know, we discussed this a number of times, since it's only Yisadur Abana, Shvus, that won't apply Ben Ashmashes, which is the moment when the air needs to take effect. So since at that moment, he has full access to the food inside this locked Migdal, the air has been activated. So this is the Shita, going back to the Shita of Rav Meir, who says that even a knife can be employed to break open this Migdal. Whereas well, a coin to blazer, if he can use his hands, that would be fine, as Rashi just explained. The problem here is that he needs a knife. And Rebbe Lezer follows Rebbe Chemin's Shita that a knife can only be used for the sake of his designated purpose. El Tzorch Tashmishon. Vika Tashmishon Shal Saken. What is the primary use of a knife? Lo Yilach Techavolamu. It's not meant to use to cut ropes. El Lechem, a basar, bread and meat. Vo'eichlan. 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 And in summation, this is the Machlekes. This is the Pshat of the Machlekes between the Tanakam and Rebbe he does not hold the Yirmiyah's limitation. He holds this Erev is fine. Because he can simply cut through the rope using a knife. Rebelezer Eimer, Rebelezer says no, he can't cut through the rope with a knife. Therefore, he says like this. If he has access to the 
key, then he's fine. But otherwise, this Erev is inaccessible. Rav Lezo, I mean, in Be'ir Ovad, here is the Erev. If the key is in the city, then it's fine. The Chimat, Kaliyah, Maishla, they're Kafifas, because he can go ahead and find the key and bring it through those storage areas, as we discussed in the, uh, the previous blot. So, he has access to that key, and he can go ahead and open this Migdal. In the Sada in the but if he lost the key out in the field, in which case he can't transport that key over to the Migdal, then the food in the Migdal is considered to be out of reach. The Mifsik Manu Lai Because he cannot go ahead and chop that rope, open the Manal, because the Lezer Fazer Mechemya Shita, that a knife cannot be used for this purpose. So, in summary, the Allah and the Mishnah is as follows. When he has the food locked into this Migdal, without a key in sight, according to the Tanakam, it's okay because he can open up the ropes by cutting through with a knife. Which a blazer holds, a knife cannot be used for this purpose. The Erev is inaccessible and therefore ineffective. Continues the Mishnah. So the person placed his Erev food at the Erev site. So generally, one would place it 2,000 Amis away from his home in order to maximize the, maximize the benefit of the Erev. So he has his home, and 2,000 Amas away, he would place the Erev, which becomes his new Shabbos residence, which allows him to walk from there an additional 2,000 Amas. So what happens if a person places his Erev at the end of the Tchum, meaning at or around 2,000 Amas from his home, and his Gangul Chutz Tchum, a wind came along and blew it away, it rolled out of the Tchum. In this case, the Arab is ineffective. Why? Explains Rashi because it's too far away from him. At the point of Ben Hashemosh, where is this fellow? Where is he? He's sitting in his home, which is right now further, more than 2,000 Amis from his food because it rolled out of the Tchum boundary. It's now 2,000 Amis and 10 Amis away from his home. So he's too far from that, from that food. He can't access it during Ben Hashemosh, and therefore that Arab cannot take effect. That's one example. Another example of a problematic Erev is Nafal of Gal. A pile of stones fell onto the Erev, making it inaccessible. Or it got burned. Or it trum of an itmis. Or it was truma and became tummy, in which, in which case it's inedible for all. So it depends when this happened. If it happens still during daytime, before the Binash Mashes, any Erev. This Erev doesn't work because it wasn't present during the time of Ben Hashemoshes, when the Erev is meant to be implemented. But if it happened after nightfall, how is the Erev? In this case, it works. Why? Let's take a look at Rashi inside. So, with the uh, lines of Rashi widen at the bottom of the Amid, let's take a look three lines above that. says Rashi. If it happened when it was already dark, then it's okay. The Erev has already acquired, has already generated once Shabbos had already received the heter from the Erev, once the, the Erev had already been established and implemented, that heter of the Erev maintains itself throughout the entire Shabbos, even if the Erev disappeared, sometimes through Shabbos. So again, if the Erev was destroyed Prior to nightfall, the Erev doesn't work. If it happened after Chashecha, then it's fine. Continues the Mishnah. What if there is a Suffolk? Im Suffolk. We don't know when it happened. If it happened prior to Ben Hashemosh, in which case the Erev is not Chal, doesn't take effect, or it happened later. After Ben Hashemosh, in which case the Erev is valid. So we have an uncertainty. We can't assume that this Erev was safe and present at the location. He's a confused fellow. He's in limbo. He's a cham or gamma. What does that mean? He must approach this, the situation, stringently, assuming perhaps the Erev was not there during Ben Hashemoshes. So, if he had a home and placed the Erev 2,000 Amas away, so you have a suffix. If the Erev was there during Ben Hashemoshes, so this allows him to walk, 2,000 Amis in this direction, 2,000 Amis in the other direction, and that's fine. 
If the Erev was not the Adorim Yerushmashis, so the, the Shvisa was really in his original home, because the Erev wasn't there. And this allows him to walk 2,000 Amis in this direction, 2,000 Amis in the other direction. So one thing is for sure. The space, the area between his home and the Erev is fully permissible. Either way, whether the home was a Shabbos residence or the Erev was a Shabbos residence, that allows him to walk in this area. The 2,000 Amis between the home and the Erev. So this, this location is fine. This area is perfectly mut. However, he cannot walk in the other direction. Meaning, there's one, one side of the coin which says, well, perhaps the Arab was implemented, was there during Ben Hashemoshes, which allows him to walk in that direction as well, past the Arab. But on the other hand, perhaps the Arab was not there during Ben Hashemoshes, which results in his home being considered his true Shabbos residence, which doesn't allow him to walk past that Erev. It only allows him to walk 2,000 Amas this way, 2,000 Amas the other way. So again, between the Erev and his home, he certainly can, can walk. But anywhere in the other direction, the other direction from his home, the other way, and from the Erev in this direction, in this case, is a Suffolk. He cannot, do, he cannot use that area. He's a Chan or Gamal. He's in limbo. As she said, it's like a person who's who's leading a donkey, who runs ahead, and at the same time, trying to lead a camel, who's lagging lazily behind. She's stuck in the middle, being pulled in both directions. This person can't assume that his house is the Makam Shavisa, which allows him to walk in the other direction. Can't assume that the the Erev created his Makam Shavisa, which allows him to walk past the Erev in the other direction. The only place which he's allowed to use is the area between the home and the Erev, and that's Rehman because either way, that area is mutter. So according to Reb Re- Yehuda, we can't just assume in a situation of Suffolk that the Erev certainly was there. Because when he placed it there, it was fine, it was healthy, it was tar, it wasn't burnt. Perhaps we should say, well, let's apply a chazaka. When he placed it there, it was present. Let's assume that that status continued at least throughout Ben Hashemash. We don't say that. We go to Chumrah and we say, well, we're not sure whether or not the Erev was present, was valid during Ben Hashemashes, and he cannot rely on the Erev. Rabbi Yehissi, Rabbi Shimon, Aymer, Suffolk Erev Kasha. When there's a Suffolk regarding the validity of the Erev, we can be Mekel, and we can say, yeah, let's assume that the Erev, since when he placed it there, it was fine, let's assume that situation, that's that it's continued, the Chazaka tells us to keep the Erev in place, let's assume it was present during Ben Hashemashes, so although now it's been burnt up, but that happened recently. During Ben Hashemashes, we presume that it was there, and therefore he can rely on the Erev to walk past the Trum. Oh, Rabbi Yossi, I'll prove it. Of Thomas, that was his name, he testified the name of five elderly Tamit Chachamim, al Safik Erev Shekasher. When we have a Safik regarding Erev, we follow the lenient approach, and we say, we assume that the Erev is Kasher. Continues the Gemara. Nesgal Gachutz Tchum. That was the first case in the Mishnah. The Arab rolled out past the Tchum. In which case the Arab is too far from him. And therefore is not Kosh. Omar Rav Aleishano. This is only a concern. Elosh Nesgal Gachutz La'ar Amas. If it rolled past four Amas of the Tchum. So we have the Tchum. And the Arab rolled away more than four Amas from the Tchum. In which case it's out of bounds. It's inaccessible to him. But if the air rolled, but it's still within four Amis of the Trum, let's say you have the Trum, and the Arab is only three Amis outside the Trum, that's fine. Why is it fine? Because whenever a person places an Arab at a certain location, that becomes his residence, that becomes his Makam Shvisa. It's like his home. We, we regard it. Like, like it was just a yachet status. So although it's not enclosed with machitzes, but it's considered to be his personal space, his personal residence. And that encompasses a, an area of four Amis, which are considered to be one and the same entity. It's one usage area, it's one residence. Says Rava. If that's the case, so even if the Arab rolled out of the Tchum, and it's within four Amis, then what happens is that the Arab creates a Makam Shvisa, like, like a home, like a Rosh within that area of four Amis. 
And since it's only three Amas out of the Tchum, so the four Amas actually extends back into the Tchum. And we view the Erev as though it's still inside the Tchum. And if it's in the Tchum, then it's fine. Continues the Gemara, of Gal, this was the next case in the Mishnah, so a pile of stones descended on his Erev. Kosaka, the Gemara figures at this point, that he can simply remove those stones manually. It's only a question of Moktza. If he would like, he can manually remove those stones. So what's the problem? Stones are mokta. And since the only way he has access to his Erev is by doing mokta, which is Rabbanam. So since during Ben Hashemashes, he didn't really have access to his food because it involves mokta. That's why the Erev is ineffective. Says Zikmar, Shall we say that our Mishnah is not following Rabbi Shita? Because otherwise, Rabbi holds, like Gazrol ben Ashmashis. The Isidra Banan of Shvus doesn't apply ben Ashmashis. So, since this situation only involves a Muktzah, which is only Isidra Banan, that won't apply ben Ashmashis, which is the point in time when the Arab is implemented. So, why wouldn't it work? Why won't we consider him to have full access to his Arab? Says, my fellow Tamaki Rabbi. Even if you'll say that our mission is following Rabbi Leitzricha, apparently we're speaking about a case, the boy Marvachatzina. He can't simply manually remove those stones. They're embedded, they're, they're, they're absorbed, they're, they're sunken. He needs to have Marvachatzina, these tools, a shovel, an axe, to unearth those stones, which is considered to be a Malachim and Atur, Chaifer. Therefore, that prevents access to the air. It's Malachim and Atur. And since the only way he has access to his Erev during the Anash is by doing a Malachim and a Torah that Erev is considered to be inaccessible and ineffective. Says the Mord Srichi, why does the Mishnah need to begin with two cases? The Erev rolled out of the Trum, so due to its location. And the next case, it was covered by stones due to the fact that it's inaccessible. Why does the Mishnah need to describe for us two similar situations? In both cases, the Erev is invalid. Why is that needed? The Eton and the Sgal of the Mishnah will only speak about the air which rolled out of the Tchum. I would say, yeah, that's, that's no good. Mishnah, the lesser Gabe, because it's not here. It's out of bounds. It's inaccessible. Avonafal of Gal. However, in the case where the Gal fell on the air, the Eser Gabe, it's still within reach. It's still within the Tchum. It's simply being blocked over. Aim will have the air, perhaps, in that case, it's a fine air. Therefore, the Mishnah needs to describe that case as well. The Eton and of Gal. If the Mishnah will only cite the second case, I would say, well, that's really at a disadvantage. We shouldn't mix it because it's covered over and it's inaccessible. And therefore, it doesn't work. But if the Erev is really here, just it rolled out of its home, perhaps in that case, I consider it to be valid. Because Zimnan the Ase Zika, perhaps sometimes a wind will come by, Umaisile, and roll it back in. Therefore, I consider that to be a proper Erev. Aim will have an Erev, perhaps. Due to that reason, we should consider this to be a proper Erev. Tzricha, therefore, the mission needs to cite both examples. Both types of deficiencies. One rolled out of the Trum due to its location, and one covered up by those stones due to its inaccessibility. Says the Gemara, Oy Nisraf, true We have another two cases. The Erev was burnt, or it was thrown that became Tameh. Why does the Mishnah find it necessary to describe these additional Two scenarios. Alamali says the Maratana Nisraf The reason why the Mishnah speaks about the burnt air that highlights the extent of Rabbi Shita, even if it's totally burnt up, it's incinerated, it's not around. Rabbi Yaisi nevertheless maintains that we we assume this air was here at the right moment during Vienna Shmashis. So that's why the Mishnah describes this case as well. It's a Chiddush. Tana Truma Venitmus. Why does the Mishnah mention the case of Truma, which became Tameh? This highlights the Shita of Rameya. Meaning, even though the Truma is right here, it just became Tameh. Perhaps, that will be reason to apply a Chazaka. You have something here, in front of you. Let's say, this thing that's here, has a Chazaka, a presumption, that it was, it was a, a proper Erev, during the Ben Hashemashas, because when he placed the Truma there, on Friday, it was Tar. Let's assume that that situation, that status, continued continuously through the Ben Hashemashis. So Rameis Chiddush is that even in this case, 
No. We go to Chumra. As the Gemara will explain for us why we go to Chumra and Vavza. Uh, uh, they're not Therefore, we're meant to follow the Chumra. And we don't follow the Chazok. Let's take a look at Rashi inside the top line. So the case of the burnt Erev highlights Rabbi Yaisi's Chiddush. Even though it's not present any longer. Loi Mitzer doesn't become Asr. We assume that it was here during Benash Mashmas. The case where the Truma was burnt, that teaches us the extent of Rabbi Shita. Even though it's present, it's here. There's room to think, there's reason to believe. Hamidan of Ben Ashmasha is Al Let's assume that during the Ben Ashmasha's point, the Chazaka can be applied because prior to Ben Ashmasha's, this truma was tar. Let's assume that during Ben Ashmasha's as well, it maintained that status and was still tar. Even so, we don't say, contrary, we don't apply a chazaka which results in a leniency. Continues the Gemara on the second line. The Savar may is fake al Indeed, as Rameya hold that when we have the Suffolk, whether the Erev was around, the Erev was Tame, then we go to Chumra and we say, we can't, we can't rely on the chazaka just because when he placed it there, it was fine. Let's assume that that status continued throughout Ben Hashmashes, and the air was present, the air wasn't Tomei. Is that the case? We seem to have a Mishnah that indicates to us otherwise. We have a Suffolk, when something is Tomei, Rameh tells us, we can follow the Chazaka, even if it results in a leniency. Says the Gemara of Atnan, how we go to the Mishnah? Tomei Shira Litva, a person who was Tomei, who went down to the mikvah to be Tomei. Now, there was a suffix that resulted from this experience. Suffolk Tavol, Suffolk Goy Tavol. He has a suffix whether or not he was Tavol. Or another case, Afilu Tavol. Or let's say he knows that he was Tavol. But, Suffolk Tavol, Barbar Misa. He doesn't know whether the mikvah contained the proper amount of 40 Misa. Suffolk Goy Tavol, Barbar Misa. Whether the mikvah did not have Barbar Misa. He doesn't know whether his Tavol was valid. Was he Tavol in 40 or not? Or another case, we have two mikvahs in front of him. Ba'achas yeish bar bar misa, one contained 40 so, ba'achas ain bar bar misa, the other one does not contain 40 so. But Tavo ma'achas, ba'achas ma'am, he knows he went to one of them. Ve'en yodeh be'ezme and Tavo, he's not sure which one he used. Sfeikai Tomei. This situation is a suffix, and he remains Tomei. Ba'me'a devar ma'murim, when is this said? The Tuma Chamura. When it involves a stringent Tuma, Rashi explains, he was Tomei, a Tuma de'ay raisa. Avo betuma kala. Well, let's say this person was was tame only a lenient tuma, only a tuma derab bana. Kigoyin sheochal oichlin tameim. For instance, he ate tame foods. Mishasa mashkin tameim. He ate. He drank tame drinks. Or another two examples of a tuma derab bana. Vabo roishe beruba yimayim shuven. Or his head and most of his body entered mayim shuven drawn water. Oishe naflu al roishe val ruba yimayim shloishe lugam mayim shuven. Or three lugam mayim shuven were poured on this person's head and most of his body. So these are all different types of Tumas de Rabbanon, as discussed in the beginning of Masech Shabbos. This fellow wants to free himself of this Tumas. Miyar Litvul, he went down to be Tavol. And his Suffolk was generated by this experience, Suffolk Tavol, Suffolk Loi Tavol. He's uncertain of whether he was Tavol, not people Tavol, or in a case where he knows he was Tavol, but there was a Suffolk as to the quantity of the water in the mikveh, Suffolk Tavol by Ram Sah, he doesn't know whether he was Tavol in 40 saw, Suffolk Loi Tavol by Ram or he did not. Or he had a choice of two mikvahs and he went into one of them. But Achaz Yeish Bar Bar one of them contained 40 saw, and the other one didn't. But Achaz Ein Bar Bar Misah. But Tavol by Achaz Man, he was Tavol in one of them, Ein Oye Deya Be'ez Mem Tavol. And he's uncertain. Which one was the mikvah that he immersed in? Sveikoy Tahar. In all these situations, we say that the Suffolk has a din of Tahara because... It's a suffix, Tumah de Rabbanon. Rabbi Yaisi, Mitami, even in this case, he holds that it's Tumah. So in any case, we have a Kasha. From this Mishnah, which is a Sta Mishnah, an anonymous Mishnah, which is presumed to be a mayor, where a mayor tells us that a suffix, Tumah, in the case of a Tumah de Rabbanon, we go to Kula, we say it's Tar. This is in contrast with the Allah and our Mishnah, where a mayor tells us, when we have a suffix as to the status of the Arab, we go to Khumra. The Gemara assumes at this point that the Arab is only the Rabbanon. So why should we go to Chumrah? Says the Gemara, 
Ramea holds that the Isra of Tchumen, leaving the boundaries, and subsequently the placement of the Arab, which allows one to go past the Tchum, is a Din Raisa. It's Isra Dai Raisa that's involved here. And therefore, when there's a suffix in this context, we must call the Chumrah, as Rashi says, Sveika Dai Raisa the Chumrah. Therefore, Ramea maintains that we can't rely on this Arab, which is a suffix Arab. As opposed to the Mishnah, which is discussing, in the second part of the Mishnah, discussing a suffix, to Medirah Bonon. So in that case, we go to Kul. Says the Gemara, the Sabar of Meya Tchumen Daraisu. Does Ramea really hold that Tchumen is Daraisu? Of Aha Tanam. We have a Mishnah which seems to indicate otherwise. The Mishnah here is describing the manner in which they, they would calculate, they would measure the boundaries outside the city. So they would use a rope which was 50 amas long. And they would measure in increments of 50 amas. Now what happens if they reach a steep mountain or a deep canyon? The Mishnah tells us there's no need for them to actually measure the surface area of that steep mountain or deep canyon. If this canyon can be swallowed into the 50 amas rope, so you have a person standing on either side of the canyon holding that 50 amas rope, and the canyon fits into that 50 amas, and you can just measure it right on top without actually entering the canyon and measuring the very surface of the canyon. Likewise with the mountain. So if it can be swallowed within this 50 amas, you're okay. The mission says, But if the canyon is too wide, the mountain is too wide, he can't swallow it into the 50 amas rope. So what does he do then? In this case, Amar of Distai, Bayanai, Mishum so he said, Neim Rameh, Shamati, I heard from my teachers, my Rebbeim, what method is employed here? Shamati Shemekadrin Behar. We bore through the mountain. Now, we don't literally mean we, we drill through the mountain. Rashi explains that we employ a method as follows. We only calculate the horizontal angle of this mountain. So you take a small size rope, four amas in length, held by two people, and they hold it just about vertically, horizontally, I mean, and they make their way up the mountain, measuring four amas at a time. So in this case, they're not really calculating the actual slope, the, the actual surface space of that, of that mountain, which will result in a much larger calculation. Rather, they go up and down the mountain using this small rope, which really results in them calculating just about the, the horizontal angle only. So this is actually a kula, a leniency. Because if they would count, they would measure the actual mountain, it would result in a greater, a greater shear. So this is the term called mekadrin baharim. It's as though they're boring through the mountain, meaning it's as though they're measuring and calculating with a straight line through the mountain, not taking into account the slope. Shomati shomekadrin baharim. Now this is a leniency applied to measuring, to calculating the shear of tchum. This doesn't apply to a measurement which is required in the Torah, as the Moral explained. Now, if you maintain the Ramea holds that the concept of Tchumen is based on Deiraisa, me Mekadrin, can we employ this method of calculation? But I'm meant to do so by Deiraisa. The Omar of Nachman, Omar of Bravua, he told us as follows, A Mekadrin, we don't employ this lenient method of calculation. Loi Bore Miklot, not when it pertains to Halachas in the For instance, the Ore Miklot, which were these cities to which a person who killed somebody Bishage would run for protection. Not only the city itself affords protection, but even the municipal boundaries, the tomb around the cities, are for protection. So when they calculate, they measure the tomb, they can't employ this lenient method of Mekadrin. Beloy Begla Rufa, nor when it comes to calculating the distance between the city and this person who they found dead, so the city closest to that, that person is required to bring a carbon for Kapara, the Eglarufa, the calf which was, uh, which was killed. So the city closest, how is it measured? You cannot measure using this method of Mekadrin. We play change of Torah. These are calculations of Torah. So apparently if the mission allows us to employ this method when it comes to Trumei Shabbos, this proves to us that the din of Trum is not not Torah. So how can you tell us that a mayor holds a Trum and a Rice and therefore goes to Chum? That's more like Kasha. The terrorist is very simple. Hadi day. Rameh himself personally holds Tchumen Adai Raisa, therefore he goes to Chumrah. Hadi Rabbe, 
This halacha mentioned in the Mishnah, the name of Rameya, was not actually his personal shita. It was the name of his, of his Rebbe. The Ekanami. Because if you pay close attention to the wording of the Mishnah, it is indicative of such. Because the Mishnah says, Diktani, Bezu Amar Rabbi Destai Rabbi Yane, Mishur Rameya. He quoted Rameya, Shamati, Rameya says, I heard, meaning I heard from my Rebbe, Shemekat and Baharim. We employ this form of measurement through the mountains, when it pertains to Tchumen. So it was his Rebbe's opinion. Who well, holds that Tchumen is a Midra Bona? Shema Mino, indeed, this is a Raya. That it was only his Rebbe's sheet, but he himself holds a Tchumen Adai Raisa. And therefore, he goes Lechum. So in summary, the Mishnah gave us four examples. Where the Arab is not valid. If the Arab rolled out of the Tchum, the Mora tells us, it was past four Amis. If a gal of stones fell on it, where well, he needs to do it with a, with, with a using a tool, which involves a Malacha, or got burnt, or the trauma became tummy. So if it happened during daylight time, the Arab is invalid. If it happened at night, then it's fine. If there's a suffix, or a mayor who holds a Tchumen Amin Atayra, he holds it's possible, because we go to Chumr. Rabbi Yaisi, who apparently holds Tchumen Amin Atayra, therefore he holds that we go leniently, and the Arab is Kosh. Continues the Gemara. So at this point, Rabbi Yaisi will hold that something which involves a Din Torah would not allow us to follow the Chazaka. Therefore, the Erev, which has a suffix of whether or not it was Tame during Ben Hashemashes, we will consider it to be Tame. We can't say, well, since when he placed the Erev there, it was Torah, let's assume that that situation maintained itself throughout Ben Hashemashes. Let's follow that Chazaka. No, according to our mayor, since it is in Torah, we say suffix the Raisa Lechumra, and we can't assume that this Erev is valid. Since we have a the Raisa, the Raisa, the Rameir, we have an apparent contradiction between this case of a Savak the Raisa, where Rameh goes to it doesn't follow the Chazaka, in contrast to another Mishnah, which involves a Chazaka, in the case of the Raisa, Rameh does follow the Chazaka. And he maintains that the person is tar based on Chazaka. V'rami the Raisa, the Raisa, li Rameh, the Snan as we learned in the Mishnah. Noka be'echad balayla, a person came into contact with another person in the darkness of night. V'eni yudeyem chayimeis, and he was unaware of whether that person was alive or dead at that moment. And if he's a mace, he is metame, the person that touched him. So there's a suffix there. Ule machar, and tomorrow, hishkim umatza mace. He got up and found this person to be a mace. So now we have two conflicting considerations. On the one hand, we have a chazaka, that everything's fine, because this person was seen alive yesterday. So let's perhaps assume that, that situation maintained itself throughout the night. And therefore, this person who touched him is tar. On the other hand, in the present moment in time, this person is a mace. Let's assume that this situation began already last night. So we have two conflicting considerations. Which one do we follow? Rameh Metar. He says this person is tar. We follow the original Chazaka. This person was seen alive yesterday. Let's assume he was alive at the point of contact. They say this person is tamid. Shekol is keshas metziyosan. Tumah is meant to be dealt with according to the present moment. If it's Tomei now, let's assume retroactively this situation was present during the night time as well. And therefore, when he, when he touched him, this person was already mace. So we see that Ramea follows Chazaka. And he maintains that this person is Tar, despite the fact that we're speaking about a Suffolk Tumei Raisa. This is in contrast with our Mishnah, where he doesn't follow the Chazaka. Omer Rabbi Yirmiya, generally speaking, Ramea does follow Chazaka. However, our Mishnah is speaking about a unique case. Mishnah Seinu, Shahoyo Leo Sheres, Kol Ben Hashemashes. Speaking about the, that the Sheres, this mouse, which is Metam the Truma, was present on the Truma the entire Ben Hashemashes. So it's not something here. It's a Vadai that this Arab is invalid. Says the Gemara. If that's the case, Ihachi. If so, Baha Lemir Rabbi Yaisi, Suffolk Arab Kasher. Would Rabbi Yaisi say that it's a Suffolk Arab and it's Kasher? It's a Vadai Tomei. Says, well, no, no, no. That's not what Rabbi Yaisi meant. Rabba, Rabbi Yaisi, the Amri Tavayu. They both explained, this is what Rabbi Yirmiya meant to say. Hocha b'shtei ki maskinan. In the case of Er, we're speaking about where there are two ki two groups of witnesses who are offering conflicting testimonies, conflicting accounts as to what exactly happened with that Er. Acha Saimeris, one group is saying, Mbodyoinetma, became tummy by day. In which case, the Er is not kosher. The other group is saying, well, this Erev became Tameh at night, after Ben Hashemashes. In this case, Rameh holds, we can't follow the Chazaka. We can't say, well, since initially, 
the Truma was tar, let's assume it maintained that status throughout Ben Hashemashas because we have two Edom who are opposing, who are giving us an account which opposes that Chazaka. Therefore, we're meant to follow the Chumra since it pertains to a Din Hatur. In contrast to the Mishnah, where the person touched somebody more than night, there are no Edom there. There are no testimonies which are conflicting, which are opposing the Chazaka. Therefore, in that case, certainly follow the Chazaka, even according to Ramea. We say, since this person was seen alive yesterday, let's assume safely that this person was still alive during the night when this person touched him. And therefore, we say he's tar. Can he lose the Rav Amar? Rav agrees to this concept, but just adds one more point. Even if we say that the story of Naga Bechad Belayla, when he touched that person all the night, unsure whether he's alive or dead, is speaking about a similar case where we had two Adam. Two key to them, two groups of witnesses who are offering conflicting accounts as to what happened. Even in that case, your mayor will hold that this person is tar. We follow the chazaka. Why? Hasam tre chazaka lekula. Because over there we have two chazakas lekula to this person's benefit. Number one, this person was seen alive yesterday. Let's assume he was alive throughout the night. Number two, the person who touched him has his own personal chazaka. He was tired prior to that experience. Let's assume that that chazaka, that situation, maintained itself. So since we have a double chazaka, we can follow that even when it's opposed by those Adam. In contrast to our Mishnah, in contrast to our Mishnah, we only have one chazaka l'kula. We have the chazaka which says, well, initially the truma was tar prior to Ben Hashemashis. Let's assume it maintained that status through Ben Hashemashis. But since it's being opposed by the testimony of those Edom, remain maintains, you can't follow the Chazak. So in summary, we have a Suffolk Tumah according to Rameir. If it involves only a Tumah de Rabbanon, Rameir holds his tar. If it involves a Tumah de Raisa, so generally we follow, we follow the Chazak. There's a Chazak's Tumah, and he's Tami. If the Chazak's Tahar, he's Tar. But if there's a Chazak's Tahar which is opposed by one of those two groups of Edom, in this case we can't follow the Chazak, and he's Tami. However, when we have two Chazakas which oppose those Adam, in this case even Ramey agrees that he's tar. Okay, time for a brief review of today's daf. The Gemara began by explaining the case where he locked his food in the Migdal. Ramey says it's okay because he can access it by using a knife to cut through those ropes. Which your blood holds, a knife cannot be used for this purpose, and therefore the Arab is inaccessible and ineffective. We discuss four cases where the Arab is invalid. It rolled out of the Tchum, was covered by a pile of stones. It got burnt, the Tchum became tummy. So if it happened prior to Ben Hashemashes, it doesn't work. If it happened at night, and it's fine. If there's a suffix, Ramey maintains, since Tumen is the Eraisa, we can't follow the Chazaka here, and we say the Erev is Pasal. Whereas Rabbi Yaisi holds Chumen is the Rabbanan, and therefore the suffix Erev is Kasha. And the Gemara concludes, although generally Ramey follows Chazaka, but in the case of the Erev, since there are two Adam who are testifying against that Chazaka, therefore we can't rely on the Chazaka, and we say suffix Erev is Pasal.